Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so good to see all of you tonight for the uh, first of our new series on uh, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Sepharad uh, and Jerusalem Intertwined, uh, which uh, will be a series that will look at the uh, historic relationship between Sephardim uh, and uh, Yerushalayim, uh, more broadly, uh, Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Um, uh, the first uh, lecture will be focusing on uh, medieval uh, Spain, so Sfarad Mamash, actual uh, Spain, uh, though as we kind of proceed through these three lectures, we'll kind of be moving forward in time uh, as well. And so this week we'll be looking at medieval times. Uh, the next class will look at the uh, time uh, immediately kind of the, the centuries after the expulsion from Spain, um, kind of what historians refer to as the early modern period. Uh, and then we'll uh, conclude with uh, the modern era, though so kind of the, the first part of the modern era, by looking at uh, Sir Moses Montefiore and kind of more the beginnings of modern, modern day Jerusalem and, and the relationship with, uh, with Sparat. So uh, the lectures will be somewhat historical, um, but will also be uh, religious in nature as well, um, based on some of the sources uh, that we'll be looking at. And you'll see what I mean um, as, we, uh, as we start. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the timing of this uh, series is, was not uh, an accident. Uh, I chose to teach the series at this time because, of course, we now find ourselves in what's known as the three weeks, uh, the three weeks from the uh, fast of Tammuz to the fast of Av, uh, which are the three weeks where uh, Jews mourn the destruction of, uh, of Jerusalem and the temple, the ensuing uh, exile. Uh, and as a result, uh, figured this was a good time for us to reflect on the enduring relationship uh, between uh, Jews uh, and uh, the Holy Land. Uh, and I chose to focus, though, on a particular group of Jews, those of Sepharad, uh, the Jews of Spain, for, for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, it is quite a remarkable story. And in many ways, uh, Sephardic Jews really have, um, perhaps until you know, the 20th century, really play, have played kind of the most uh, meaningful or pivotal role in that relationship um, you know, over, over the millennia. And so we'll be kind of uh, uh, celebrating that, uh, that story as well through, uh, through this course. Um, <clears throat> and so I hope that it will uh, be uh, a way for us to kind of connect with uh, these three weeks. Uh, the first two classes we're in now will be during the three weeks, and then the third class will be uh, just after the Fast of Av, which will be good because we'll be talking about the rebuilding during the times of Montefiore. So that will kind of fit with the, uh, the theme of things uh, as well. Uh, so thank you all for, for coming tonight uh, and uh, glad to be studying with all of you. So let's uh, go into the first slide. The, the first slide that we're going to look at is really uh, attempting to just set a bit of uh, context for our conversation. And so I'm gonna begin by showing you uh, this map uh, over here. Uh, this is a map that shows uh, the uh, Mediterranean uh, basin during the ninth century. Uh, now, of course we know that uh, Jews originated in Judea, um, which is the land uh, of Israel, uh, which included the city of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. Um, the temple was destroyed in 70 of the Common Era, uh, and then Jews were largely expelled uh, in the second century uh, during the Hadrianic persecutions. Uh, there remained Jews afterwards a bit more in the north of Israel, in the Galilee, um, and, and certainly Jews have remained you know, living in the Holy Land uh, throughout all of this time. Obviously, uh, to, to, to smaller or larger extents, depending on the particular century, the uh, political environment, the, the economic environment, the, 
religious environment, you know, throughout those, throughout those years. Now, while obviously originally it was under Roman rule, uh, and then under, uh, you know, kind of Eastern Roman rule, Byzantium, uh, it came to be obviously dominated by uh, Muslim rule, you know, from the eighth century uh, on. Uh, though, as we'll see, obviously it continued to be uh, uh, under, uh, under uh, conflict uh, as a result of the Crusades and attempts of Christians to regain control uh, from, from Muslims. Uh, and kind of that interplay, uh, we'll speak a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, the story we're going uh, to have. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to try to understand Sephardim and their relationship to uh, Yerushalayim or to, to the Holy Land. Now, when we think of, when we say the word Sephardim, right, we, we, mean, uh, we mean Spain. And so one of the things we have to kind of just start with is, you know, looking at how Jews came to be in Spain and a little bit of the, uh, um, shall we say, the cultivation of Sephardic identity, um, which, which is something important for understanding the relationship. Now, this map that we're looking at shows the ninth century. If I were to show you a map from the eighth century, there wouldn't be different colors on this map right? The whole thing would be under what's known as Abbasid rule. Now, originally, the, the original Muslim rule was the, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, eventually was taken over by the Abbasids. And that was kind of the dominant rule until you get to the ninth century, when the uh, Muslim rulers in Spain declare themselves to be their own independent caliphate, and in a sense, the reemergence of the Umayyad uh, caliphate. Um, and so what you have happening within, shall we say, the Muslim world is a, uh, is a um, breakdown of, of its rule, where it's no longer kind of one massive caliphate, but it will, there will be multiple caliphates uh, in these areas. Now, when you talk about the time that it was unified, of course, then the Spain, as it were, is being ruled from, from Damascus or for wherever the caliphate is going to be based. And as you would expect, that means that there will be communication and trade and, and, and uh, centralization that will keep, right, even these, these areas on the periphery to continue to be linked to the central authority in the Middle East. But when that breaks down, obviously then there no longer is that sense of the center being in the Middle East, but the center is now in your local government, right? So in this Umayyad uh, Caliphate in Spain, it will now be its own independent thing. Its center of focus will be local uh, to where it is. Um, and as you would expect, right, Jews have settled some of these areas as well. So as uh, Muslim rule has spread out, Jews that were living in under Muslim rule have also spread out uh, along with them as well. And so there is a Jewish community which is taking root, uh, certainly in North Africa already, um, and also into, into Spain. Uh, now what's interesting is that the uh, Sephardic community, and again, we'll, we'll look at this and, and think about what this means, right? In a sense, originates in Babel, in Babylonia. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because the Talmud, which is followed, uh, is the Babylonian Talmud in Spain. Uh, you may be aware that there were different Talmuds that were uh, compiled. Uh, while the third century rabbinic text is no, known as the Mishnah, which is in Hebrew and therefore is clearly written in uh, Eretz Israel, uh, in the land of Israel, you then have later rabbinic texts that will be written in uh, Aramaic. Uh, one of those later uh, texts, known as the Talmud, is known as the Talmud 
Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud or the Palestinian Talmud. And you have another one known as the Talmud Bavli, right? The Babylonian Talmud. The uh, Jerusalem Talmud is from the fourth, fifth century. And the Babylonian Talmud is from the fifth, sixth century. Uh, now, some scholars in trying to understand some of the differences in practices between Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews want to claim that perhaps the, some of the Jews in, uh, in Italy, right, the Ashkenazi Jews, um, had actually uh, been coming from the Holy Land because you see some influences from things we know from the Jerusalem Talmud on some Ashkenazi practices, while the Jews in Spain are very clearly following the Babylonian Talmud. So that you can kind of see some of those, those differences um, taking place. Um, we'll explore a little bit more what to necessarily make of that, um, but just as a way of kind of understanding to the start about how closely linked Sephardic Jews were with uh, Babylonian Jews, which, you know, perhaps is why it's, it's so nice that here in London, right, the Jews from Iraq became part of the Spanish and Portuguese, because originally the Spanish and Portuguese had come from Iraq. So, you know, in that sense, there is a, uh, obviously a historic relationship uh, between, uh, between Babylonian Jewry and Sephardic Jewry. Um, but as we know, ultimately that will, that changes, that changes. Um, and there is a uh, early text, a medieval Jewish text that uh, tells a story about when that, shall we say, division uh, took place. And when you ended up in a sense then having, you know, the Mizrahi Jews, the Eastern Jews, and the Sephardic Jews, the Spanish Jews. So let's take a look uh, at this uh, source. Uh, the source is from a book that's known as Sefer HaKabbalah, which is not Kabbalah in mystical sense, but the book of tradition uh, that was written in the 12th century by Avraham Ibn Daud. Uh, and this is a, uh, a kind of a, a rabbinic history, as it were, from the 12th century, telling the story of Judaism, of, of, of rabbinic Judaism, uh, from you know the times of the uh, of the end of the Bible, right through the, the rabbinic times, through to to his own time. And one of the things that he explores is the history of the Jews in Spain, because that's where he was. That's where he was living. And so he tells the following story from the 10th century. Okay, and he tells this story. This is known as the 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 the, the story of the four rabbis. So it says the following, it says the four rabbis were on their way from the port of Bari, uh, perhaps Italy, uh, so that's uh, in this translation where they've added that in, on their way to attend a kala, a rabbinic convention of the Babylonian academies. And so there was something that was known as the Yorche Kala, which was an annual or semi-annual convention that took place in Babylonia, where, where scholars would go to Bavel, um, often, you know, in Baghdad, um, and then, and there they would have kind of in this major rabbinic convention that would take place there. So they had these rabbis that were traveling, right, to, uh, to the Kala. What, but what happened? Their ship was attacked by the notorious pirate Ibn Ruhamis, who was harassing sea routes on behalf of the king, Abdur Rahman on Nasir, right? And so this reflects uh, people who were operating on behalf of the caliphate in Spain, okay? So they had their pirates that were disrupting uh, trade uh, in the Mediterranean. The sages, though, did not reveal their identities or their scholarly credentials to their captors, right? They were worried that if they knew that they had captured such preeminent rabbis, that perhaps, uh, you know, they, they would be, you know, the ransom would be, would be insane. So they didn't say who they were. They were just some Jews. Right, they were subsequent. Though the text that was on, they were subsequently sold or ransomed in various ports. And so, one went to Alexandria, one to Tunisia, one to Cordoba, and an, an unidentified locality. It then goes on the story. It says each of the four scholars rose to a position of leadership. 
right, rose to a position of leadership and became the founder of an illustrious rabbinic academy in the place to which he was taken. And so what this story is trying to explain is how did it happen that there ended up being great academies of Torah scholarship outside of Babylonia, right? Why was it that there were these places of scholarship in Spain, in North Africa? I thought it was all in Bavel. How did it happen? And so this gives a story that says the way it happened is because there were rabbis who were captives, who were sold to Jewish communities that were in these places. They were such illustrious rabbis that it planted academies in these different uh, locations. It's a great story. Scholars debate, you know, is, is there some truth to this? Is, you know, it, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. This story was written down several centuries after the event itself had taken place. But what the story at the very least does reflect, whether or not the actual episode happened, is that it starts to be around the 10th century that you start having no longer this attitude which says, you know, if we have questions, we need to turn to Babylonia in order to answer those questions, but that these communities start to, be in, start to become self-sufficient, right? Self-sufficient where they are not uh, looking to the East for religious guidance, but they can look locally to their own religious leaders. And this really begins this period of kind of, uh, of identity, of kind of this sense of self among Sephardic Jews, that they are their own community, and they have their own identities, and they have, in essence, ultimately, even their own religious tradition. It also balances out with what historians say is kind of the decline of, at the same time, obviously, the authority of Babylonian Jewry. Uh, this entered a time of, um, of uh, the end of what's known as the period of the Gaonim, which were the, the rabbis in, in Spain, right? The famous or Hai Gaon, or Shrir Gaon, and so forth, right? The leaders of Babylonian Jewry, but in essence, the leaders of the Jewish world, where as a result of probably ongoing conflicts within those regions, including some persecutions of Jews, you really kind of have a decline uh, of Babylonian Jewry from that, shall we say, preeminent role within the Jewish world. But well, again, you have this division where you have now different religious centers, um, but no longer these unified thing. And so in a sense, it very much reflects the, uh, what's happening, and perhaps not surprisingly, in uh, the Muslim world, right? That what's happening in the Jewish community is simply, shall we say, reflecting the reality of their political situation. And perhaps it's somehow being determined by it. Meaning when you have this breakdown among the caliphates, it's not so easy to write letters back to the rabbis in Bavel for guidance because there's, they're not unified. It's not a, over a unified political world anymore. And so as a result, in a sense, you have to become self-sufficient. You have to become more localized because there no longer is a unified network with which you can rely upon. So be it as it may, whether it's because of the story of the four rabbis, whether it's because of what's happening, you know, in terms of the politics of the Muslim world, uh, Spain becomes increasingly independent and self-sufficient in the context of its Jewish community. But of course, as a result of what that means is that it is increasingly cut off from the land of Israel, from Yerushalayim. And that's what I'd like to explore with you today, is how there begins this, shall we say, this self-conscious attempt to cultivate a identity, shall we say, a religious identity that identifies with Jerusalem, with the Holy Land. And while that may not be an identity which is grounded in a physical reality, or in a actual kind of contemporary relationship with those places, it begins to become a intellectual or spiritual relationship with this, which no longer relies on a physical connection because that connection 
relies within the religious persona of Sephardic Jewry. And so what it does is without being able to rely on a physical connection, it perhaps strengthens that connection by saying this connection will now exist on a plane which is no longer limited to a physical uh, reality. Uh, and it is Sephardic Jewry that really cultivates the, the, the notion of what is Eretz Yisrael, what is Yerushalayim within the religious ethos of the Jew. Uh, and so uh, the impact is, uh, is amazing. And that's what we're going to look at uh, tonight. Before we go on, uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so let us, uh, let us continue on. So we're going to take you to a source, which some of you- Rabbi, read. forgive me, I raised a hand, but I didn't get it in the, in the screen. Um, what about Alexandria? Why didn't, or did it, um, self-consciously produce its authoritative academy? And uh, 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 we know that Maimonides um, went to Alexandria and eventually, I think, died in, in uh, uh, near Haifa, but what happened? Are you saying that Alexandria didn't take the same leadership role among what we'll call in your context Sephardad as as those physically in Spain? Well, so it's a great question. So I think what what the story is saying is it explains, shall we say, the fact of how there are how there was even an academy of of some sort in in Egypt, in uh, Tunisia, right? These are all kind of separate, you can see from that thing, different political areas. And the point is saying that they all became religiously, uh, shall we say, independent, where they had their own yeshivot, their own, their own rabbis and so forth. And that was, now, maybe none of them became, you know, end up producing what, what Spain itself produced. And obviously that will be part of the story is that there were communities in these places and they had rabbis, but obviously, the, ultimately, the, the most well-known of the rabbis from medieval times, right, we know is the Rishonim, will come from Sfarad itself, right, will come from Spain, a bit from North Africa, right, from, from Morocco, but really from Spain. Um, and so the story is just kind of like describing like the kind of like the, the seeding of these different communities um, or the seeding of their, the the, the, the rabbinic aspect of these communities. Um, but obviously, as the story continues, we see that Spain really runs with it, right? Spain becomes so, so important. Um, and yes, eventually some of the rabbis from Spain will then go and live in other places too. And we'll talk about Rambam tonight uh, as well. So we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get back to that. Good. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on now to a... Uh, a, a very important pasuk uh, in, uh, in uh, Sefer Ovadia. Uh, so it says in the book of Ovadia, which is a chapter long, so the, the 20th verse says, and we read this in the Haftarah, I think on Shabbat Vayichi, though I may, I may one, one of the parshiot at the end of Bereshit, we read this Haftarah, and it says that the exiled force of Israelites shall possess what belongs to the Phoenicians as far as Sarfat, while the Jerusalem exile community of Sfarad shall possess the towns of the Negev. So it's describing, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the messianic vision, and it's describing, right, that there were the, the Israelites, right, and there are the uh, Jerusalemites, and kind of what they will ultimately possess and where they will go. And there is a tradition that associates Sarfat with France, and that identifies Sepharad with Spain. Now, again, the, the different commentaries and, 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 and modern historians debate whether or not Sepharad in this pasuk is referring to what we refer to today as Sepharad, whether it's Sarfat in this context is what we commonly refer to as Sarfat today, but certainly it became identified with the, uh, with the, 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 the centers of, of Spanish Jewry, 
right, as Farad, and the centers of Ashkenazi Jewry in France in Sarfat. Uh, and so this led to a self-conscious identity among Sephardim in Spain, that they are not simply descendants of Judea, they are the descendants of the Jews of Jerusalem, which in other words means that they are the descendants of the nobility, right? They are the descendants of the leaders of Jewry, right? And so in this sense of um, aristocracy, right, that would have come with sense that we are from Jerusalem, right? We were not the, uh, the country Jews in Israel. We were the city Jews, right? We were the Jews of Yerushalayim. And that becomes really important, right, for that sense of who they were and that strong sense of identity. And we may even see how that plays out in some of the future lectures uh, as well. Um, but what that means is that the Jews in Spain had a sense of identification with Yerushalayim, with Jerusalem, right? That then, in fact, that's where they had originally come from. Now, I don't know that any of them carried with them keys that they said came from Jerusalem, like the Jews in the Ottoman Empire said that they brought from Spain. But they did have this sense, right, that they had come from Yerushalayim. And so there is the sense that even though the um, political realities have divided them, have dislocated them from Jerusalem, that's where they originated from. Now, the fact that they follow the Babylonian Talmud, not the Jerusalem Talmud, you know, that starts getting into more complex, uh, more complex realities. But there is this sense that they had that their community did originate with the Jews of Yerushalayim. And, uh, and it's fine, because again, the Jerusalem Talmud is not necessarily from Jerusalem. It's probably from North Israel. So that's why some people refer to it instead as the Palestinian Talmud, not the Jerusalem Talmud. In any case, don't get too tied up with that. Um, and so it's important to kind of appreciate that Sephardic identity has always, in a sense, because of this pasuk in Ovadia, had this sense that there is this like deeper connection of Sephardic Jews with the Jews of, uh, of Yerushalayim. And again, maybe we'll, uh, we'll reflect back on that uh, at some later time. But it, it may explain, you know, there's this story people tell about, uh, about um, Benjamin Disraeli, you know, that when he was in, uh, when he, when, he, when he was in uh, parliament that somebody, you know, critiqued him as being descendant of Jews. And he says, he goes, well, my ancestors served in the, you know, temple in Jerusalem. Your ancestors were, you know, uh, you know, worshiping idols, you know, in the, in the hinterlands of Britain. So I don't, know if that, I don't know if that story is true or not, or whether, if this is what he was referring to. But there is this sense, right, that the Jews of Spain originated in, uh, in Yerushalayim, uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, so let's go on to the next source, because what I'd like to now show you with the time that we have is to see the way that the, the rabbis in Spain cultivated this uh, identification, or not, and even beyond identification, but the sense of longing and the sense of appreciation of what Yerushalayim, of what Sion, of what Zion means for Jewish peoplehood. Right, and that it's not simply a place in our past, but it is an ever-present uh, place for Jews as the place that we ultimately will return to as well. Perhaps the most the famous of, uh, of, of these people uh, are, and I'll show you in the next sources, uh, excuse me. is uh, Yehuda Halevi, right? Um, the author of the Kuzari, one of the most famous poets of medieval Spain. He lived into the 12th century, and he writes this beautiful poem, My Heart is in the East. And he says, right, Libi ba Mizrach, right? My heart is in the East. He says, my heart is in the East, and I in the uttermost West, meaning Spain. How can I find savor in food? How shall it be sweet to me? How shall I render my vows and my bonds while yet Zion lies beneath the fetter of Edom, meaning under Christian rule, and I in Arab chains, meaning under Muslim rule? A light thing would it seem to me 
to leave all the good things of Spain, seeing how precious in my eyes to behold the dust of the desolate sanctuary, right? To see the, to even see the ruins of Jerusalem, right? So he's contrasting that in Spain, the Jews are living in riches, right? This is the golden age of Spain. It's, it's fabulous. You know, Jews are viziers and are generals and are, you know, you know, major, you know, figures in, in uh, Andalusia, right? In medieval uh, Muslim Spain. And he says, what I would give up to go rest amongst, you know, the desolation of Jerusalem. And this has become like one of these like beautiful poems that like speaks to the heart of the Jew, that no matter where we are, no matter what luxury we have, that our heart, right, nor are we physically, our heart always remains in Jerusalem, right? Our, our heart always remains uh, in Zion. Uh, in fact, some of his other poems, Sion, Halo Tishali, right, Zion, right, do you remember your, those who, who have been exiled, right, is read by Ashkenazim on the 9th of Av, right, as part of the Lamentations, right? And so the beautiful poems of Yehuda Halevi have really become part of almost the liturgy of the Jewish soul, right, that really they speak to this enduring longing that we have for a return uh, to, uh, to the Holy Land. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll speak at the end of this class what, what, happens, uh, what happens with uh, Yehuda Halevi. Um, but really, I think this poem really captures that, 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 that fervor, that love affair that was not lost, you know, that ultimately was not lost despite the distance, despite the time, despite political division, you know, separation, that, that there was this awareness that, that he had for the connection to Yishalayim. And by putting those feelings into words, right, it, it crystallized it. It, it, it. it ensured that that would not be forgotten, that that would always uh, remain. Um, and so you can see that this, you know, and again, this, this incredible kind of appreciation of the importance of Jerusalem, right, even for a Jew in Spain, who had it the best in the Jewish world, you know, that still said, I'd give it all up, you know, to go to, uh, to, go to Jerusalem. So a beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful poem. Uh, they were, the, 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 the poetry of the Sephardim is, uh, you know, par excellence, the, the, the best. We, we use a lot of it in our liturgy in the Spanish and Portuguese uh, on uh, the high holidays. Uh, but it's magnificent. And they, they wrote religious poetry, they wrote secular poetry, it's worth reading. It, you can pick up translations of uh, Spanish uh, poetry. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Okay, so let's move on now to some of the other ways that uh, a connection to Jerusalem was preserved even in exile. And so the next one is Ramba, Maimonides, right? And this is I'm not even going to show you a source. I'm simply going to show you the table of contents of the Rambam's most important uh, legal work, the Mishneh Torah. Now, when we think of legal works today in Judaism, right, the most famous is that of the Shulchan Aruch, right, the Cairo Codes, written by Rav Yosef Kara. We'll talk more about him as a person uh, in the 16th century. And uh, Rav Yosef Karo is work has four different uh, sections to it, and they relate to laws that have to do with, you know, with um, daily ritual, they have to do with issues of marriage and divorce, laws of kashrut, as well as business laws, right? In other words, they deal with laws that were relevant during the lifetime of Rav Yosef Karo. And that was common, you find that he copied that from the works of the uh, 14th century uh, important work, uh, the tour that was written in, uh, in Spain. It was, you're writing all legal work, you're writing a practical legal work that's meant for people at your time. The Rambam did not do that, meaning he did that. He wrote about all those things, but he also wrote about things that were completely impractical uh, as well. So if you look, he wrote 14 volumes to his Mishneh Torah. And if you look at them, we'll start on the left column. He writes, the book of knowledge, the book of the love of God, the book of seasons, right? All those things that have to do with things that are relevant. Uh, book of women, right? Family law, marriage, uh, the book of holiness, uh, dietary law, sexual prohibitions. He talked about the book of utterances, right? They deal with vows. And then all of a sudden, the book of seeds, 
which deals with agricultural law and other commandments effective in the land of Israel. Continuing on to the next column, Sefer Avodah, the book which focuses on temple worship. There was no temple in the times of Rambam. He goes on, the book of sacrifices, the books of purity, which govern purity within the temple. Book of damages, okay, property, personal injury, that would apply even in his time. Book of acquisitions, again, in his time, that would, be, that would apply. Book of civil laws, okay, in his time, that would apply. And then again, the book of judges, which covers the legal system, the political system, and so forth. And so all of a sudden, you see that the Rambam, in his writing, covered the whole spectrum of Jewish law, even laws that were not relevant in his time, but would be relevant in the future when Jews would resettle the land of Israel and reestablish its own governance in the land. Now, during times of Rambam, the land of Israel was being fought over between the Muslims and the Christians. <laughs> the idea that Jews were going to regain independence of the land of Israel was the furthest, furthest thing from any practical reality. But by writing legal codes to govern those things, what he did was ensure that Jews would always remain hopeful that one day they would, right? That it was realistic, that it was possible that one day it would happen. Uh, and so his work is incredibly important about the enduring sense that Jews in Spain had that one day they would return to the land of Israel, that that relationship had not been severed, uh, you know, beyond repair, but one day uh, it, would, uh, it would resume. And in fact, nowadays in the land of Israel, when there are questions about laws, really the only code that, they're, that they have to look at for kind of what did the medieval rabbis think on a particular issue is Rambam. Because the other ones didn't write about it, at least not in an organized way, because it wasn't practical. So they didn't really write codes about these issues. But one person who did was Rambam, was Maimonides. So again, it shows that uh, sense that, that he had, that that was a relationship that uh, endured even into uh, a time when Jews were not governing uh, themselves in the Holy Land. So very important work, I think, about the, I, that consciousness that remained alive uh, for Rambam and, and, and through him, Sephardic, uh, Sephardic Jewry. Okay, let's go on. I wanna show you one other set of sources that now kind of take it a bit further, right? We've seen this kind of like longing for Israel. We've seen this belief that there would be a return to Israel. But what we're seeing in the next source is, shall we say, a religious appreciation of the significance of Israel within the Jewish uh, tradition. And this source is going to ultimately be from Ramban, Nachmanides. Nachmanides lived in the 13th century in Christian Spain, right? So he lives after the time the Jews have been expelled from southern Spain. They've either gone to North Africa, as, as the Rambam would, or they've gone north into Christian Spain. And that's where Rambam lived in the city of Girona, right, Girona, uh, outside of Barcelona. And he, we're gonna look at two of his comments on different verses in the Torah. The first is on the verse in Deuteronomy that says, it is a land which the Lord your God looks after, on which the Lord your God always keeps his eye from year's beginning to year's end. And so this is a very intense pasuk where the Torah describes God's focus, God's preoccupation with the land, meaning with the land of Israel. And right, that God is in a sense constantly paying attention to it. And so the Ramban explains what does that mean? And Ramban says this, Ramban was a bit of a mystic, so he, he, you find this kind of language in him where he says, there is also in this verse a profound secret. By that he means a mystical truth. Being that this land is cared for in all things and all lane, lands are sustained from it in truth. And what he says is that in some sense, what happens around the world is determined based on what happens in the land of Israel. 
that the land of Israel is the focus of God's attention, and it's through the land of Israel that ultimately the rest of the world receives blessing or curse or whatever the case may be. Uh, and without any kind of modern day political interpretation of that, right? There certainly, right, is this, shall we say, the spiritual truth, says the Ramban, about the spiritual role that the land of Israel plays for uh, the entire world, uh, the globe over, right? So here you find the Ramban, in a sense, raising the significance of Israel beyond it's our homeland, beyond it's where we hope to return to, but to say that actually there's like a spiritual power to the land of Israel as well, right? It's no accident that that's where God sent the Jewish people. It's no accident that that's where the temple was, that God, that's where God's presence was felt. The Torah tells us that God's focus is on this part of land, and it's through this that everything around the world is ultimately impacted, right? So he's raising the significance of Israel even further within the eyes, within the consciousness, within the, shall we say, appreciation of Sephardic Jewry. Look at one more source from Ramban, where he kind of goes even further. It's quite striking a statement that he says. So here he says, he quotes the verse in Leviticus. These are the curses, the blessings and the curses in Leviticus. So here quotes one of the curses that it says, thus the land became defiled, meaning that in the future, people may defile the land through sexual immorality, through idolatry. And I called it to account for its iniquity and the land spewed out its inhabitants, right? That the land will literally spew out its inhabitants from the misdeeds of the people living there. And the Ramban says the following. He says, the rabbis have said in the Sifre, which is a early rabbinic text, and ye perish quickly from off the good land, right? That the following verse continues, and you shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, right? That the verse says, you shall be exiled. And then it says, and you shall keep these words on your heart. So Ramban interprets, what does that mean? This clearly indicates, even as the Sifre teaches, that after banishment from the land, they are to continue to observe the commandments. Although I banish you from the land to outside the land, make yourselves distinctive by the commandments so that when you return, they shall not be novelties to you. And so the Ramban here says something like crazy, right? Which is not the way we normally perceive things, but it's still important to like appreciate like the, the attitude Ramban had, where he almost describes the observance of Torah in the diaspora as something we do simply to ensure that we will not forget the Torah for when we ultimately return to the land of Israel. In other words, the primary place of the observance of Torah is in Eretz Yisrael, not in exile. And we do it in exile so that we should not forget how to do it because one day we will return. But that the the ideal place to observe the Torah is in uh, the land of Israel, right? And so in a sense, our observance of mitzvot take on greater significance when we do them in Israel as opposed to in the diaspora. The Ramban uses a, uh, a, uh, a uh, metaphor. He says, you know, if the king commands his, his people to do something, so he says, you know, if someone in the, uh, you know, out in the countryside does it, Okay, it's nice. If they don't do it, okay, it's not, they didn't do it. But if someone's in the palace and doesn't listen to the king, that's going to really make the king angry. If someone in the palace listens to what the king said, the king is really going to appreciate that. And he says that kind of explains the significance of when we observe the Torah in Israel, like how important it is versus when the Torah is observed outside of the land of Israel. So don't take this too seriously. We are obligated to keep the Torah no matter where we are. But he does, in a sense, takes this idea further about like the added significance of the observance of mitzvot uh, in the land of Israel. So again, he's kind of taking and increasing the religious significance, as it were, of Torah observance um, in, 
in uh, Eretz Yisrael. Uh, and so what's important to hear is, again, he's, he's moved the, uh, the, uh, the bar, right? Israel is not just where we come from. It's not just a place where we hope to reestablish a state, but it's actually a place of incredible religious significance, right? A place where, you know, that is where we are meant to follow the Torah. It is through what happens in Israel that the rest of the world is impacted, right? And so even more so, that's the place to be, right? That is the place that God gave us, and that's the place we must always remain connected to, no matter where uh, in the world uh, we find ourselves. Um, and it's ultimately through all of these teachings, right, that these uh, great sages were able to ensure that the relationship to uh, the land of Israel and to Yerushalayim in particular would not be simply a memory, but would be a living reality for the Jews uh, in Spain. Right, that not only would they have a sense that their ancestors had been the exiles of Jerusalem, but they would remain confident and hopeful that their children would one day return uh, to that very Jerusalem. Uh, and what I think is so amazing about these three sages is that ultimately, uh, these were not only words, but ultimately led uh, to actions. And so I don't know whether any of these depictions are real, but just these are different statues and pictures that they have. So Yehuda Halevi very famously went to Israel. He went to Israel. There's a story that's told that he actually reached the gates of Jerusalem, or perhaps even overlooking uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the area in the old city. And as he was there, he was singing you know, the, his, his, his poems about, uh, about Israel. And at that point, he was struck down by uh, an Arab riding a horse, and he died. And uh, in fact, there, if, you, if you go to Israel today, that huge staircase that leads down from the Jewish quarter down to uh, you know, the, the, the plaza in front of the Western Wall are called the Ma'alot uh, Yehuda Halevi. Right, they are called the steps of Yehuda Halevi, and it's based off of that idea that, like, that's where he got to. Right, he died along those along those very steps. Right, so he actually he put his money where his mouth was. He actually left Spain. He left the good life uh, and uh, traveled to Israel, perhaps even dying upon arrival. We know for sure he made it towards Egypt, but we think he he did make it uh, uh, all the way. Um, the, uh, the figure on the right in these uh, pictures is Rambam, Maimonides. Uh, Rambam, we know uh, his family was driven out of Spain uh, during uh, a, a, a uh, persecutions, and uh, he eventually would settle in Egypt, but we know he spent some time in Israel as well, um, and perhaps even uh, got, went to the old city and, 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 and was by the area of the Temple Mount. Um, ultimately, uh, things were very complicated. I mean, at the time of Christian rule in, in Israel at that time, so it probably wasn't a place he, he really properly could uh, settle. So he ended up going to Egypt, where he became obviously the, uh, you know, one of the senior rabbis uh, in that community. Um, but again, he, he himself made a point to, uh, to go on pilgrimage to, to Israel. Uh, and the final figure in the middle, Ramban, uh, actually is, had to escape to Israel as well, um, there's the famous uh, disputations in Barcelona, I believe in the year 1267, um, that uh, he, he defended uh, the Talmud uh, against the Christian uh, arguments against it. Uh, but ultimately, as a result, he had to flee. <laughs> so uh, he ended up fleeing to Israel, and he settled in Jerusalem and founded a synagogue in the old city that was known as the Ramban Synagogue. And you can visit it today. It also became known as the Horva Synagogue or the famous arch above it, they've now rebuilt the dome, but the lower floor of it, what they say dates back to the times of the Ramban, and that that's in fact where he, uh, where he lived. And there's a place on Haraz 18, I believe, on uh, Mount of Olives, there's a cave there where they say that's where Ramban was, uh, was, ultimately, uh, was ultimately buried. Um, so all these sages you know, spoke about you know, belief in the return, and they all did. They all, they all made a point to actually return at some point in their life. 
Um, and so it's, again, this, this amazing legacy of the Sephardim where they, you know, they, they could have forgotten Jerusalem. They could have lived the good life in Andalusia, you know, in uh, the golden age of Spain, but they didn't. They, uh, they never forgot their connection. They wrote some of the most enduring uh, texts in Judaism that ensured that Jews would always remain aware of their love, of their connection, of their future uh, to a return uh, to the Holy Land. Uh, and so they never forgot their origins. They never forgot that they were the diaspora from Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, if the Jews in Spain, you know, who, who were living, you know, this great life, they never forgot, and ensured that all Jews around the world never uh, forgot either. And it's one of the great legacies of Sepharad. And so what we'll do next week is look at that this legacy lived on, meaning that when the Jews were actually expelled from Spain, Israel became part of uh, their, uh, one of the places that they went to as a destination. We'll talk about that uh, in next week's uh, class. Um, before we conclude tonight, does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, in that case, I would like to thank all of you for joining me uh, tonight, and I look forward to studying with you uh, in next week's class. Thank you, thank you very much. It's absolutely very fascinating. That's a really fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you very, really, very, very interesting. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Bye, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Rabbi Murray.